Right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's installment of the CRP Colloquium. I'm really delighted today to welcome Ms. Manal Manal Avalara to come to the Prevention Institute, and she's up early in her morning in Los Angeles time, and um, we'll introduce her shortly. Before we get fully started here, I would like to talk with our land acknowledgement today. Cornell University is located on the traditional contents of the California. Okay, Cornell members of the Hudson Missile Game in Better City, an alliance of six of my six salvations with historic and super presence on this one. The Confederacy received the establishment of Cornell University in New York State and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Cayabono. This position, this position and honor the ongoing connection of Cayabono people past and present to these lands and water. Right. I'm actually going to introduce um, Dr. Amelia Weiner Saki of Alia Fan, uh, who is both at the Department of Communication in Cal as well as the the program in public health here at Cornell. Uh, the program in public health is co sponsoring this event um, because it is at the intersections of public health and planning. As we have discussed in many of the classes that we have shared here, there is such a long historical division between planning and public health. In the very first conference of the American Planning Association or the early planners, there was only one female delegate. Um, and she was really interested in issues of social well-being and health and education uh, in the tenements where people are actually living of immigrant families. And on the other hand, were arrayed all the engineers, the architects, the landscape architects who were the early leaders of the field and who effectively marginalized this concern of health as being something separate from the purpose of planning. So in much of our Western tradition of planning, which has also had global, uh, uh, global impacts, we have basically had a very strong focus on urban design and space planning, not often with uh, attention to the impact that they have or the uh, ways in which space can actually contribute to health and well-being. I think in the last really the five, 10 years, we are seeing more of a coming back together of these fields. Social welfare eventually became its own program, and public health has become a field where um, we see researchers actually bring the work of social welfare and, and health and planning back together. And this is precisely the nature of the talk that we have today and that the work that Ms. Abuela has been doing. I'm here to introduce her today is Dr. Brian Asafi, who has her master's in science and communication from Cornell, focusing on risk in science communication and her PhD in social and behavioral sciences from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She holds a joint appointment between the Department of Communication and the Department of Population Medicine and Diagnostic Sciences in the College of Veterinary Medicine, where she is a faculty member of the new Masters of Public Health. Her work focuses on translating between and among various audiences to identify and advance common interests, engage audiences and change behavior, identify and understand the impacts of how topics are framed, um, and, and to communicate <clears throat> these complex human and environmental issues. This has led her to work on health impacts of zoning, including conducting a health impact assessment, the media presentation of risk and human environmental ecological health linkages in the, report, in, uh, in the reporting of both EPA and FDA, seafood consumption in arteries and the deep water horizon uh, oil spill, among many others. In the Department of Communications, she currently directs a $3 million award for the National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration to understand the impact of the FDA's proposed graphic warning labels on cigarette packages and ads on emotional reactions, health beliefs, and smoking contentions. Over 30 years of team by mobile lab research, outfitted with eye tracking computers, were involved nearly 4,000 adult smokers and middle school children from the Northeast. So please take away in here. Linda, would you like me to go? Oh, 
Okay, so everyone, hi. I think it's my turn now to speak. Apologies, the sound is just a little bit off. So again, thank you so much, Linda, for that lovely introduction. I'm Amelia Greiner Safi. I just wanted to provide a few words to build on what Linda was saying about the links between urban planning and public health that tie in really closely to Manal's talk today. Um, so the how our public health program approach, approaches public health is through three core pillars, and that's equity, sustainability, and engagement. And one of the ways that we operationalize that is to think through the many factors that influence health, disease, and well-being. And so that means thinking about um, issues like parks, which are incredible assets for mental, physical, and community health, but also about the power and policies that influence where they're located, how they're maintained, and who has access to them, because that influences the nature of the health benefit or the harm. It has a lot to do with health equities and health disparities. And with that, it is my distinct and great pleasure to co-sponsor this talk um, on behalf of the MPH program. So I will try to get this correct. So Manel Abalata is Deputy Executive Director at Prevention Institute, a national nonprofit dedicated to advancing effective strategies to achieve health equity, prevent illness and injury, and ensure safe and healthy communities. An epidemiologist by training, Manal advocates for health equity and racial justice. She writes and speaks on many issues, especially those pertaining to health equity and the built environment. She has co-authored a chapter in the first and second editions of Making Healthy Places and written the foreword for a forthcoming book, Schools That Heal. In the form of original articles, op-eds, and policy briefs, she has written extensively on timely, relevant public health justice issues. Manal has served on numerous health advisory boards, review panels, and expert councils. She's currently serving her third and final term as an appointee of Supervisory District 2 for South Los Angeles to Los Angeles County's Community Prevention and Population Health Task Force. And I graduated from UCLA in 2001 with a master's in epidemiology and from UC Berkeley in 1998 with a Bachelor of Arts. And I was inducted to the UCLA Hall of Fame in 2009 and was a Stanton Fellow of the Durfee Foundation from 2017 to 2019. I'd like to hand over the stage and warm welcome to you. Thank you, Linda and Amelia, for that warm, gracious opening and introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to speak with you today. Let's see if I can move my slides forward. Um, today, I'll be talking about park inequities, sharing with you a framework for reversing unfair and unjust differences in access to and quality of parks and green space for black and brown communities. And I wanna share with you a little bit about a new national initiative that we are very proud to launch um, under the auspices of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Doris Duke uh, Charitable Fund. Um, and this work for me is all about improving health, well-being, and sustainability in low-income communities of color. That's what all of my work has been about. Parks though, as important as they are, are just one facet, as Amelia said, of a healthy neighborhood. In a healthy neighborhood, members of a community have a range, access to a range of high quality environments. They enjoy stability and peace, have access continuously to high quality, affordable shelter, education, nutritious and affordable food and incomes that allow them and their families and loved ones to thrive. Um, people in a healthy neighborhood get to have the benefits of a balanced ecosystem, sustainable resources and experience the fruits of social justice and equity. And so I wanted to provide that more holistic view because even though I'll be focusing on parks and open space, for me, they are just one element of a healthy um, community, um, but they also are really important exemplars um, of what we can and should be doing to ensure that everybody enjoys um, the human right to a healthy neighborhood. Some of the work that I'm going to describe today is really born out of a set of experiences that I and my colleagues have had in LA County where I live and work. I live and work in South Los Angeles. And so this work um, also uh, is deeply impactful for me in terms of thinking about equitable distribution of resources and opportunities that all people need to thrive. But just as a bit of context, um, between 2016 and 2018, Los Angeles County voters 
passed a series of infrastructure um, measures that were presented to them at the ballot box um, to really uh, improve quality of life in the region by um, raising taxpayer dollars to invest at the things that all of us need, a good high quality transportation system, parks and open space, um, measure W was to um, capture, recycle, um, and reuse stormwater. And then measure H um, was a sales tax to address the major housing crisis um, that we are facing in Los Angeles, like in other parts of the world. As Amelia mentioned, I was a fellow of, um, a Stanton fellow of the Durfee Foundation. And um, during the years that I was a fellow, I had the opportunity with support from the foundation to really look at these different different um, measures. And I was really curious. I, I don't, I didn't know a lot about public financing at the time, but I was really curious about what could be done to influence the, those measures once they were adopted so that they would be implemented in ways that would promote equity, support health and well-being in the communities that had been historically um, disenfranchised through policies and practices. And so some of what I'm going to be sharing is really rooted in that experience experience and my sort of account of my experience as a fellow is documented in a new publication that I was very excited to release called Healing Neighborhoods, where I'm looking at the role of public investment in realizing the human right to a healthy neighborhood um, using these infrastructure measures as a lens. And the reason I kind of wanted to set that context is also because I think right now with Congress, um, and, and President Biden negotiating a major infrastructure package, um, I think we have a tremendous opportunity to sort of move beyond business as usual practices uh, and deepen uh, proactively investments to advance uh, climate justice, racial justice, and health equity with our infrastructure investments. And I actually think this administration is very amenable um, to that orientation based on uh, a, a lot of the indications that they've given. As Amelia said rightly, parks and green space have so many benefits um, to public health, well being, um, and the climate. Uh, and we are, the data is really in a nascent stage, but it's really starting to paint a pretty consistent picture that parks and open space are valuable to people's physical health, their value in communities. Um, and we know that not all parks are created equally. And so in some communities, um, they, due to ne neglect or uh, lack of care, they um, don't always confer these great positive benefits. And, and that's an equity issue as well. But even more than the evidence um, that's beginning to emerge from um, established institutions um, like yours and researchers, it's really amazing to me in the work that I've done that parks are really important to people for a wide variety of reasons that go beyond the data. Um, our colleagues at a really great organization called Berkeley Media Studies Group their expertise is in communications and media advocacy. They facilitated a session um, on behalf of Prevention Institute and they asked uh, uh, our participants in one word, why do parks and green space matter? And you can see, first of all, that people, uh, many people could not limit themselves to one word, but also um, they had a lot to say about parks, that for parks, for them, evoke feelings of love, laying in the grass. They talked about soccer, no cars. And so there's many, many things um, that people really have very emotional ties to parks, either in their personal experience, family experience. People talked about potlucks, uh, trust building, um, and I love the one, don't feed the ducks. Um, you know, so people have stories to tell uh, that I think really show us how important parks are in the fabric of our lives. Um, and it really has helped me to appreciate um, the value of parks and open space, again, as one aspect of healthy neighborhoods. At the same time, and unfortunately, we also know, and national data has shown, African-Americans, Latinos, and people who live in low-income urban neighborhoods have less access to green space than people who live in more affluent or predominantly white communities. This research comes from our, a research partner of ours, Alessandro Rigolone, um, in the University of Utah. And some of the work I'll be sharing today, in addition to this um, fact from his uh, 
2016 landscape analysis um, is uh, shared in some of the uh, planning work that we did for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. His findings were corroborated and confirmed in a groundbreaking uh, countywide comprehensive park needs assessment that was done in Los Angeles, um, led by our county's Department of Park and Recreation. They too found that African Americans and Latinos are more likely to live in areas that have less park space per capita compared to whites and Asians. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the landscape, the sort of red and orange areas indicating very high and high need at the sort of center lower of the map are um, South LA. And not surprisingly for all of you who are expert at looking at geospatial maps like this, um, this probably could be a map for any number of health and environmental indicators of concern. Um, because when we find inequities like this, it's typically not just for one indicator, but a host of others, which is why we talk about communities experiencing cumulative disadvantage or um, cumulative um, impacts of being under-resourced and neglected through policy and practice. Sort of depicted another way, um, LA County's ca county average for park acreage per 1,000 residents is 3.3, but you can see with this bar chart that there are pretty tremendous disparities. Um, for the population that lives in very high need park areas, um, those individuals have 0.7 acres per 1,000 residents. Um, and moving all the way up to the far right, you can see that the portion of the population that experiences um, the greatest access to parks or have very low park needs um, enjoy 52 acres per 1,000. Those are people that live right next to our regional parks and large sort of open space and forests. And unfortunately, these lines are really drawn um, and, and sort of almost are proxies for racial segregation and economic um, segregation in our, in our area. And I think that the number um, percentage of the population who lives in high and very high need areas hovers pretty high. It's like 52% of the residents. So a lot of the population actually is sort of packed in and densely um, populated um, parts of the county um, with very little access to green space. And um, what was innovative about the countywide park needs assessment and then corroborated here by the Trust for Public Land, it's not just access to acreage, but that um, black and brown communities or what they call majority non-white neighborhoods tend to have smaller parks that serve more people. And so that raises the issue of what we call park pressure. And the countywide park needs assessment that I referenced in the last slide, they were looking not just at acreage, but also created a really useful indicator of park acreage. And so that tells us that it's not just the, the pure acreage, but the quality of the facilities. And other data has also shown that um, the outlays um, of municipalities for maintenance, uh, park staffing, also um, mimics and mirrors the kind of inequities um, it, that are shown here in the park size and pressure data by the Trust for Public Land. So where do these inequities come from? A paper my colleagues wrote um, for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, to look at sort of how our health inequities uh, produced across a number of multi-sector systems. They developed this graphic, which I really think is, is interesting. It's like uh, cogs of a, of a, a wheel um, or cogs in a system to identify historic and present day policies and practices that produce, reliably produce inequities across a number. This one is the one that we developed for looking at uh, park inequities. And you can see things that you all have studied, been familiar with, um, like redlining, the impacts of racial segregation, um, in LA, this has been a major factor, interstate highway systems running through, but that's not just limited to Los Angeles, displacing um, typically and disproportionately lower income communities of color. Um, even our you know, vice president and president have talked about wanting to have new infrastructure investments repair past harms done from um, racist practices in the highway system development um, and so on and so forth. And so you can see that a number of factors like have produced park inequities um, uh, reliably and consistently often exacerbating or widening existing gaps. But just as uh, the creation of park inequities is a sort of a human made phenomenon through decisions, policies and practices, 
we believe that there are pathways to getting to green space and park equity. And I will be sort of pivoting into how we think that can happen. Um, we believe that it's very important to continue to research and ground truth the inequities that are on the ground also to move upstream and analyze root causes, and then develop with people that are on the ground, at the grassroots, in communities, solutions that are winnable. Um, and I'll be talking a lot about this. Amelia in her introduction noted this, really important. We think the issue of building power is incredibly important because often, um, jurisdictions and decision makers do need to be compelled to move beyond business as usual um, processes and procedures. And very importantly, and something we learned uh, with the measure A is that we need to have the ability to continue to oversee how these um, investments um, are implemented because often the passage of a, a finance measure and infrastructure measure is really just the beginning of a long journey um, that takes many years before money actually hits the ground and results in the physical projects that make a difference in people's lives. And um, Things can go wrong along the way um, without folks paying attention to making sure that equity uh, promises uh, are, are realized and protecting um, uh, any ground that's gained in terms of uh, uh, promises for equity. So the way we think this pathway really works um, is, is captured in framework that was first, I think, advanced by a researcher named Therese Yuen where she lays out three key dimensions of equity. And the reason we have found this so helpful is because what we were finding is that when we would take our sort of public health hat and practice and share it with people in other disciplines, namely those who are sort of coming from a more traditional environmental background, um, there was a sense that uh, equity was pretty much a moral argument. Yes, we believe in equity, we believe in the value of fairness, but really, how do we get there? And so we have felt, found and felt that Teresa's uh, framework for procedural, distributional, and structural equity creates some parameters around thinking about where do we want to change processes, decision-making processes for park services, park functions, how services are provided, programming delivered, um, is a way to really look at closing gaps. Distributional equity is probably the dimension of equity that is more um, most readily, readily thought of when people think about infrastructure because it has to do with the distribution of physical attributes um, and, and just straight up money. Where does it go? Uh, so this is, has to do with the distribution and accessibility of park infrastructure, um, green space facilities, and also amenities. So what's in the park? Is it just a green space or does it have things that are culturally appropriate, universally accessible, and so on? And then thirdly, we think that structural um, equity is a really important one. This is probably the most amorphous one and sort of the hardest one for, for even for me to grab onto, um, but it has to do with the things, the conditions, policies that kind of um, live in systems. And I think about when I think about systems like a park and recreation department, it's kind of like what happens if nobody pushes or changes the structural factors. These might be hiring practices. These might be um, training practices and so on um, that sort of lead to business as usual practices. And so we're not gonna close gaps by doing the same things that we've always done. So often that means putting guardrails in place in the structures and the systems to really get to more equitable outcomes. Um, I went over the, these quickly and I'll kind of fly through them again here, but procedural equity deals with dimensions of who participates, how they're engaged and how their input is valued and applied. And it also has to do with think procedures and processes like, um, how, again, how services are provided. Distributional equity I mentioned has to do with fair and just distribution of resources. Um, and also I think very importantly in an equitable system and an equitable society, it means that we all regardless of race or income have to share not only the benefits but the burdens in fair and equitable ways. Uh, and too often what happens is that low income disenfranchised black and brown communities get saddled with the burdens um, of society, polluting facilities, um, 
bad land use and zoning practices and don't get the benefits um, in an equal and fair and just manner. With Measure A, what this graphic, partial graphic shows is that we were able through advocacy to um, secure a 13 point percent set aside um, for the Measure A revenues. As I mentioned earlier, that was a expected to raise about $96 million a year in perpetuity for parks and open space. When the um, measure expenditure plan was initially presented, the goal was 18% set aside. Um, this um, was fought by, back against um, by fairly well organized affluent um, homeowners groups who said we have park needs to 13% isn't fair, um, but we were able to secure that. And that was a, a minor win, I would say, but it ended up being very important as we moved into implementation. So keeping moving, look Looking at structural equity, um, one of the examples that I really appreciate is Minneapolis uh, Park and Recreation Board has done a lot on um, sort of internal work at home to look at racial equity. Um, as I noted earlier, this addresses um, underlying structural factors and policies that sort of, again, reliably produce inequities, those cogs that I showed. And really, I think importantly, use a past, present, um, and future analysis um, that looks at rep repairing past harms, closing current gaps, and using an oversight and evaluation framework to make sure that we're looking sort of into future generations and closing gaps and correcting course when gaps don't appear to be closing. Um, and so you can look on um, the internet, Minneapolis has done some ter terrific work to look um, at the inequities in their system, both in terms of internal practices like hiring, diversity, equity and inclusion, um, enforcement um, of uh, practices by park police, as well as literally distribution of capital funds um, and developing new criteria for how they will invest capital. And one of the ways that they did this, and actually I believe New York City did this as well under Commissioner Mitch Silver, um, really looked and said, you know, we are going to prioritize the parks within our system that have not experienced, um, received uh, capital for rehabilitation and sort of schedule them and, you know, faster than those who tend, um, have tended to get funding. So it's really a proactive um, effort. Um, and what they found with their mapping, again, was not surprisingly that, um, you know, when they looked at their communities of color, those were the least well invested um, over time. And they are working on a journey to close those gaps as well. But I think um, at, we are at a moment where this is an unprecedented opportunity. Parks are having a moment. And, you know, I have been in public health for a long time, and it is important to seize these moments and sort of go through these opportunity windows um, when they arise. And some of it is um, a window of our making as advocates and practitioners. Some of it has to do with the climate crisis that we're facing. We recognize these um, key co-benefits. We recognize that 90%, I think, of the U.S. population will be in cities um, in just under three decades. And so it becomes very important. But a, a few other things, I think, happened um, in the last couple of years. I think following the um, murder of George, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, we had a real acceleration, um, uh, a visible reckoning, racial reckoning. This was not new to any of us who have been working on racial justice. It was not new to the Black Lives Matter moment. But I think that the sort of confluence of factors that occurred. Many people at home, the, the viral uh, video that went viral of George Floyd's killing by a uh, uh, officer, un another unarmed black man, that people really are elevating and speaking into the need for an approach, a racially just approach. And it, it really sort of, I think, shut down um, in some communities, some sectors, some funders that we can just continue to do business as usual. And so this has become really pivotal and important um, to um, the work in the park and green space arena as in many others. 
Um, I also think COVID um, has created a very interesting heightening of awareness about the importance of park. This is a picture from the LA Sentinel, um, really a, a black owned paper um, in Los Angeles. And this is Dr. Elaine Batchelor, um, a, a, an outstanding leader um, who um, runs um, the historic Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Hospital in Watts Willowbrook. And really the heading says it all. Um, she, she says, we need to learn um, uh, build on what we've learned from COVID. And, and as, a, as a doctor, she makes a very important point on the right-hand side. She's talking about in infrastructure going beyond roads and bridges. She goes on to talk about social infrastructure, but I think um, parks have been a really important part of the conversation. And during COVID, parks were really interesting because you may remember that there was all kind of conversations. Should we close parks? The park that my, um, my son and his friend, whose mom is on the call um, with me now, go to they they uh, put like these wood blocks over the basketball hoops. So at a time when our teenage sons had nothing to do, were not able to go to school, they couldn't even go play basketball at the park, um, which led me um, to write an, a guest editorial to Cal Matters, a, a statewide newspaper uh, that said, if we can you know, distance at grocery stores, surely we can do the same at parks. And this is a picture from uh, San Francisco, I think, where they're really saying, you know, giving the guidance around COVID. But you'll remember that there was a lot of discussion. The park agencies were really trying to be supportive. They were closing down facilities in some places, um, but in other places they became the sites of emergency food distribution. Um, they became later became the sites for um, trusted places to get vaccinations. And so parks really entered into this public health crisis in a way that I think, um, you know, uh, that we we hadn't seen them before. And of course, very importantly, for people who, you know, don't have a private backyard um, and were crowded at home, um, you know, having to, to um, you know, be indoors all the time with very little to do by the way of going to local businesses, libraries had shut down. Parks were places for respite um, and to get some distance. And so this all escalated um, at, at a moment where the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation was really had been investing in um, the issues of, of park and green space. But I think they caused them to sort of take a step back and say, you know, what is needed now at this moment where concerns of racial justice, climate justice, and this public health crisis of COVID and specifically the inequities we're seeing in COVID come together. And so they put out a call for proposals um, looking for a group to help them plan a new uh, park initiative. And I think that really created, all of this created an opening for our organization um, to compete effectively and, and win a six month planning grant. And, and during that time, we work closely with the foundation. Um, we have some tremendous supporters within the Robert with Johnson Foundation um, among them working with us to help us think about this. We conducted a series of subject matter expert uh, interviews to just learn from people across the country what they were doing in the areas of parks and open space, um, particularly those who had thought about policies and system change in terms of park um, inequity. Um, and, and this was just a sort of a, a graphic showing some of the places where we got to talk to people. Um, I think we did like a series of 26 or 28 subject matter expert interviews um, um, with my team at Prevention Institute, as well as Alessandro from University of Utah. And we did like 90 minute semi-structured interviews. And we, out of those interviews and conversations, I think really strengthened our own sense of how important um, doing policy and systems change work in this arena is. One of the things that we also, um, that I'll go into in a minute is that the dominant frame in parks and green space work and park and green space equity has been project-based. And that um, we have come to the conclusion is uh, net, as they say in public health, necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, we believe um, that we need to address the underlying policies and systems if we are going to get um, change at the scale of the problems um, that we face and at the pace um, that responds to the urgency uh, that uh, we are seeing in terms of both climate health uh, and racial injustice. Uh, as I said, um, the dominant approach has been really investing capital in brick and mortar projects and um, 
you know, occasionally doing that in black and brown communities where parks and open space are, are really vitally needed. Sometimes it also has to do with reprogramming or adopting vacant lots. And these um, projects are incredibly important. They're inspiring. They give us um, a vision for what's possible and they make real change on the ground. But when we look um, at those kind of maps that I showed you earlier, the inequities are too glaring, they're too big um, and they're too consistent and they're too widespread that we um, really feel that it's critical that we also leverage the skills and um, and, and capacities of policy and system change advocates, um, resident leaders, organizers, and uh, political strategists to do the kind of organizing, leadership development, um, fund development, um, political campaign work, and coalition building that is need to create um, broad scale uh, norms change and really reframe the whole debate. And much of my work um, it, over my career, whether it has been sort of a, in tobacco uh, prevention, early day, uh, you know, later days, early days of my career, or in the work that I've done on uh, sort of uh, chronic disease, diet and activity related chronic disease, I have found that uh, issues of systems policy and norm change are incredibly important for getting beyond sort of individually focused approaches. Um, and so, you know, as I, as I mentioned, public health can really rely on and share with other fields some of the lessons we learned from tobacco prevention and control. In the early days of that work, the focus was, as you all probably well know, on behavior change um, and telling people to stop smoking because it was bad for their health, while um, industry and, uh, you know, promoted the idea that it was just uh, a matter of freedom and individual choice. Um, but we, what we found and what we lay out in a paper um, in, that was really is called Changing the Landscape, the same name of my talk, and that became the framing um, for the planning work that we did for Robert Wood Johnson was that um, by learning from the policies, we uh, policy wins of tobacco, alcohol, injury prevention, violence prevention, we can take lessons from these public health successes and apply them not one for one to the issue and the current moment we're in with park um, inequities um, and green space inequities. And one of those key issues is mo moving from a focus on individuals to a focus on community conditions. Another is a focus on behavior and behavior change to a focus on policy and system change. And these are the kind of transformations um, that we will need to make in order to scale up the kind of approaches um, that we're seeing uh, all across the country emerging. What we saw in our landscape analysis for the foundation is there are a number of promising policy um, that are emerging all over the country, mostly as you can see um, on the coast, but many notable things scattered in, um, in other parts of the country. Of course, we don't know everything that's going on, um, but this gave us a hint um, that there's some great work to build on. We also felt um, as we talked to people that this work as of yet is not very connected. So for example, the folks in, in Fresno who are doing some incredible work um, to do a, a citizen's campaign, a resident's campaign, um, that successful campaign to raise a 3.8 cent sales tax um, for parks and open space, they aren't in a position to learn from what's going on in Miami-Dade, Florida, um, share notes and be part of a national network that really would represent a more broad scale movement demanding park equity and green space equity. And that's really what we hope to do. What we also found in the landscape in terms of kinds of policy, and this is not an exhaustive list, but we do talk about this um, in, in our paper um, that I hope to share a link um, to with you is that public finance, like the measure that I talked about, um, is, is a dominant type of policy. Um, there are some, like um, in Minneapolis, organizational changes where they are, are doing racial equity 101 trainings and unbiased trainings for their staff, all staff. Um, we also have found, like the LA County Park Needs Assessment and in other places, excellent work um, to uh, codify uh, park disparities and inequities and document needs. Uh, as you probably know, there's a number of great examples sort of systems wide and individual levels of shared use of parks of, of school grounds um, for to provide recreational for recreational uh, needs um, in communities. 
also land use policy changes um, to really in, embed um, in zoning and planning um, the idea that there should be parks and green space um, available as part of communities and some really great work um, in policy to also codify and raise the bar for expectations around participatory democracy and community engagement. And although there aren't a lot of these, um, there are some very interesting, I think, emerging examples trying to tie the issue of anti-displacement and gentrification to the issues of park and green space. So one example that I am familiar with in LA County when we were working on the Measure A uh, implementation guidelines, um, there was a really excellent um, group of advocates who were concerned about sort of the, the phrase they use is sort of green gentrification. When you invest in a community um, in park and green space, improve the area, does it create uh, an increase in the price of uh, rental and housing that pushes people out? And um, you know, I am of the mind that the forces that cause gentrification and displacement are much more complex than just green space. Um, I think there's still a lot of emerging uh, data on that. But nonetheless, I think there's um, a real opportunity to tie together the aims of those concerned about improving the quality of communities, typically, particularly those who are doing that with the goal of um, achieving equity, don't want to increase access to parks and green space only to find all the people they were doing that with and on behalf of get pushed out. So I think that this is a really important nexus that we'll see more of. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, the goal of a, a policy and systems approach um, to park and green space is yes, to have more projects and infrastructure on the ground and to have the money flow more seamlessly, more easily into communities of color, low income communities that have been historically uh, park poor, high need in terms of park area and disenfranchised, but also at the same time to build the capacity of residents and organizations in those communities to be able to receive those dollars and have a say in how those facilities are built and programmed and be part of those, those solutions rather than what typically seems to happen is large you know, uh, organizations sort of parachuting in and dropping parks into communities. Um, that is um, important dynamic that we hope to address and rectify um, to have a more inclusive approach to the work. Um, I've been referencing the paper. Um, this is um, the cover of it. It's available on our website and we presented it at the end of our what really was an eight month planning process to Robert Wood Johnson. And it has become um, in many ways, the guiding frame for the initiative um, that we just launched with them. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read our theory of change, but every good public health uh, effort seems to need um, a theory of change um, where uh, we lay out the rationale, the problem, the strategies we think are critical, indicators of progress that we could look at along the way and the long-term outcomes we hope to see um, in our national initiative, which we are calling People, Parks, and Power, um, to bridge together some of the issues. One of the reasons we name People, Parks, and Power in this initiative is because we know that Black and Brown communities have been excluded from the field of parks and green space for so long. We were concerned that if we just named the initiative Parks around Parks and Green Space, people working at the grassroots in communities of color um, would not see themselves as um, desirable applicants. And in fact, one of the ways uh, I could really, we could use your help and support is if you know base building and power building organizations working in communities to help spread the word on this initiative. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it is funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Doris Duke Charitable Fund. We are so proud um, that we were able to bring those two foundations together. Um, they, between them, they are making in this very first round $7 million available. Of course, um, a, um, a modest sum compared to what is really needed to address park needs, um, but a tremendous step forward and a huge, I think, um, signal to the field coming from the nation's largest health foundation, um, and one of the most reputable and old um, uh, environmental and conservation funders. 
we um, sort of responding as best we could to what we heard in our subject matter experts um, are uh, making $250,000 a year uh, available for a two-year two period. Um, obviously, when we want organizations to invest, our hope is that they do so over the long term. But one of the challenging dynamics that all of our work, um, much of our work faces in public health, particularly in the nonprofit sector, is that we work on grant funding and often um, it takes a lot to get foundations to invest over 10 and 15 years, the length of time needed really for generational and multi-generational change. Um, grants will start on May 15th, 2022, and we will be making awards up to 14 sites. Um, we are focused on urban communities, um, and the foundation, uh, sort of as a through line in their work, is very interested, in this case, Robert Wood Johnson, in emphasizing investments in small and mid sized um, cities. But we will see, um, you know, what we get uh, when LOIs are due on November 4th. Uh, our focus, um, as I said, based on the landscape analysis is focusing on what we call upstream policy and system change. So we are not funding plans um, or the building or operating of individual on the ground projects. Again, we know that's important. That's just not what this initiative is about. And um, applicants will be nonprofit organizations, again, to sort of reverse this dynamic um, so that we're investing in the capacity of um, organizations working in urban low-income communities of color across the US. They don't have to have a track record in park and open space equity if they have a track record on other policy issues and are eager to um, apply it to the parks and open space. We would really um, love to see that translation of skills and talents and community engagement applied in this area. Um, and we think this really builds on, again, some of the lessons learned from other public health successes, drawing on um, important and proven power building strategies um, and um, really building on and creating a track record and knowledge base around how green space and park equity work um, advances um, uh, from this point forward and builds on what's out there. Um, we are sort of uh, arranging ourselves around four pillars for this initiative. I've already spoken to some of them, but we'll go through them, I hope, quickly enough, um, uh, again, one by one. Uh, policy and system change, why? One of our subject matter experts said, we can be building, opening, and operating parks for 100 years, and it is not going to move the needle as much as through policy policy change and system change. So part of it is that we feel we're at a juncture where we need an accelerator. Um, the second pillar is about community power building. Uh, my friend and colleague and someone I admire greatly at the um, University of Southern California's Equity Research Institute, Manuel Pastor, director there, has says, philanthropy has long thought about the social determinants of health, but not always what determines the social determinants, and that's power and policy. So drawing from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's definition of power, we I wanted to share this one because often power feels like a very amorphous thing, but they define community power as the ability of communities most impacted by structural inequity to develop, sustain, and grow an organized base of people who act together through democratic structures to set agendas, shift discourses, influence decision-making, and cultivate ongoing relationships where there's mutual accountability with decision-makers that ultimately change systems and advance health equity. And this is really our guiding definition for what power is and what it looks like and what we're trying to fund. Here, I'm sharing a picture um, of the residents, moms um, who had successfully testified um, at the Board of Supervisors who acting in their role as overseeing our regional parks and open space district in LA after they compelled the board to approve a set of implementation guidelines that codified several key steps of how those measure A dollars would be designed to go flow more equitably into high need communities. Um, this was not a panacea. We didn't get everything we wanted, but um, their sh uh, smiles, their shirts, um, I think exemplify what community power looks like in practice. And in the um, 
center in the jacket is a, a county supervisor, Hilda Solis, who represents kind of the areas of East LA, which is um, uh, currently a predominantly Latino community. It has actually uh, strong African American and Jewish roots in parts of her district as well, but also has been one of the districts that experiences some of the greatest park inequities. Um, a number of freeways crisscross her district, um, uh, sort of uh, subjecting residents to significant air pollution, making the uh, potential for parks and open space with tree canopy incredibly important for the health and well being of children and families in the community. Um, and, and another uh, statement on power, um, Frederick Douglass, um, a man who escaped the institution of uh, the, uh, the bondage of slavery, an activist, a public speaker and leader for ab abolitionists, um, says here, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. But he also famously said that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. The rest of that quote goes on to say, find out just what any people will um, quietly submit to and you have found the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed on them until they are resisted either with blows or with words um, and he talks about the limits of tyrants and so this these words his words any words you, you probably pick from Fred, Frederick Douglass reminds us that our actions including our resistance to inequity is what brings about justice, economic justice, political justice, moral justice, climate justice, health justice. Um, you, we can't go down without a fight. The third pillar of um, our work and our initiative around urban areas, and I see you, Amelia, thank you, um, is a focus on urban areas. Um, and if my slides will continue to move forward, um, the reason we're focusing on urban areas uh, is because uh, the data has demonstrated that it is low income African Americans and Latinos in urban areas that are focused facing the most significant park disparities. Um, let's see my uh, slides have frozen here. And the fourth pillar has to do with community driven policy action. Um, we uh, One way I wanted to share. Let's see. Did I, um, yeah, the um, one piece of work that we did before we started this work um, was actually a very cool project on looking at park equity, life expectancy, and we engaged a community collaborative, a community advisory build comprised, uh, com sorry, community advisory board comprised of power building organizations in Los Angeles. And they helped us to develop the predictive research model that they would produce data linking life expectancy um, and park access uh, to parks and open space park equity. Um, the research was conducted by our colleagues at UCLA, um, but the model was really developed and guided. And we developed a whole toolkit um, really that was around supporting these power building groups to engage in further advocacy to oversee the implementation of the park measure that I mentioned. And so this is um, an example of um, our work sort of in a highly urbanized area. Um, and again, showing the advocates, the residents demanding park equity now um, in the city, uh, the county chambers of LA County. Um, which, um, you know, again, reemphasizes the need for us and the pillar, fourth pillar of our initiative, which is the importance of community driven policy action. Um, we know that things that come from the bottom up um, are hard, they're complicated, uh, but they often are more enduring. Um, in Fresno, as I mentioned earlier, young people, advocates um, work to uh, put a, a measure P on the ballot. Uh, it actually uh, withstood uh, um, a, what is the word, uh, resistance and uh, uh, from, from, uh, from city officials um, and, with, and was upheld by um, the Supreme Court and they will be generating resources to fund parks. And in their work, um, they had a, again, like LA County, a needs assessment to document inequities in spending, in operations, in maintenance, and Measure P is specifically designed over time to um, rectify those um, inequities. And it was extremely hard work and their implementation will continue to be hard. 
Uh, this is um, the other, the, the uh, logos of the organization that were part of our community advisory board. Um, ours and UCLA and the Center for Health Equity are um, sort of the backbone and research support and a, and a research partner, but the other ones are um, straight up power building organizations that were really central to our framing and our understanding of the work and the tools that we developed in the policy toolkit for our um, small area life expectancy work, which importantly, I think presents a model that other locales across the country um, can apply. Ultimately, um, the hope is that we scale up for social change um, and health equity and racial justice at the national level, maybe the global level. And to do that, um, we need sturdy organizations and a national network. Um, so we're connecting those and weaving together the local initiatives and models um, that currently exist. We need to transform the narrative. What we found in our literature review and our research is there are some very biased, racist and exclusive narratives um, that really reinforce the idea that parks and open space um, are not for black and brown people. Um, and, and those are narratives that need to change. Um, and then and to continue to build the evidence base both at the ground level and in the halls of academia. Ultimately, and when we say this in our uh, Changing the Landscape paper, parks and green space inequities will continue until systems, policies, practice, and norms that produce these inequities in the first place are redesigned to produce equitable outcomes. I want to bring my presentation to a close by thanking the Cornell University College of Architecture, Art, and Planning for inviting me here today and so graciously hosting this talk. Um, also want to thank the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Doris Duke Charitable Fund for their support of the, um, the P3 initiative, Par uh, People, Parks and Power, and then thank the Durfee Foundation for their support of me as a Stanton Fellow and the Healing Neighborhoods um, publication um, that I shared with you early on. Also wanna share the Urban Institute, they were the intermediary for the small area life expectancy data I shared. Um, Although we are far apart due to the pandemic, I am just an email um, away and um, encourage you to contact me um, and, and invite you to. Um, I am a public health practitioner and, um, and uh, love to hear from emerging leaders in the field. And I think that brings us hopefully to enough time for Q&A. Um, thank you, Amelia. So I think um, what I'll do here is just offer a comment or two and start off with the first question and then tag team with Linda. She'll um, kind of identify students to ask questions. And if for some reason you can't hear, then I can help translate. Um, first of all, I just wanna say, wow. I mean, what incredible work and incredible partnerships to make very important change happen and really think about a model for lasting systems change that goes beyond one-off products. So there's, I feel there's so much here for students to learn and understand. And I kind of wish we had a whole day at a seminar to, to dig into all of these aspects. Um, so as someone who's interested in communication and this idea of narratives, I'm wondering if you could, if you have any kind of successful examples within the park and equity world of changing the narrative. Um, so I know within the tobacco world, part of the narrative that had changed was, you know, tobacco and cigarettes being very sexy and very cool. And that has very much changed now. Um, do you, are there success stories yet? And could you, could you give a couple more specifics? I know you, you hinted at some of those in your talk, but I would love to hear just a couple more details um, as I think that'd be helpful for students to identify what to change. So the first thing I'll say is um, we actually, as part of the initiative, are bringing Berkeley Media Studies Group um, in to work with us and our sites to work on first, they do a th process called develop a yellow book. And so they'll work with the 14 sites we select to analyze local media and how the narrative is playing out in local environments um, and, and, and then to help us develop message guidance around that. And they are very clear, they're public health folks and they are very clear. You do not develop your messages and framing before you have strategy. So they're always like, you need to know what you wanna do. And, and so they're right now just coming on board with us 
Um, and but but I will say a couple of the things that I feel like are beginning to be bright spots for us. Um, it's some of the local work um, is the idea of changing um, the idea that parks are niceties to necessities. And mm -hmm. so we have started, I think, to see more um, emergence of the idea that parks are critical infrastructure um, and not just nice things to have that people don't really need. And so this is part of, I think, elevating it on the, the political. I do not feel like that's a widespread narrative yet. And so that's what I think we're, where we need to go, as you said, sort of from one-offs and bright spots to things that are, are bigger. I also think um, the, that we are starting to see in our country the renaming um, of parks and open space um, facilities. So we just had an example in California um, where they're renaming one of the um, parks in the far north. My a director of health equity just did a, a sort of a blog piece on it where they were renaming it to uh, acknowledge the Yurok tribe, uh, indigenous tribe who had stewarded the land, you know, forever, um, <laughs> you know, and, and to, and, and I think the renaming, although it does not replace policy and system change, is also part of changing the historical arc of the narrative about who, what land is, who it belongs to in stewardship. So I think that that may also dovetail into to some of, of the work um, that we're doing. And, and I think that's probably a, another example. We still have to do more work around that um, those Jamboard that I showed, that was a BMSG um, piece to look at some of the values and um, that people held and, and they helped us to come up with the name of the initiative. And so a little sort of temperature check or toe in the water around that was us adding people in front of the name and power in front of it. So that's a little piece of narrative um, work, um, but much, much more to be done. So. Um, and I guess one other piece I'll say, we are, um, RWJF has a standard uh, traditional communications firm and, and they're an excellent group. Obviously they've worked with RWJ a lot, but we are finding it extremely difficult to communicate our perspective and our values. It is very hard, as you mm. know, from all of your public health work to make public health and policy aims and system change aims attractive and sexy and kind of narrow it down. Um, to a thing. So, you know, the dominant frames continue to reinforce projects um, and, um, and that makes it challenging. So I, I know that we have a lot of work to do. And my hope is that when we fund these 14 sites, including some that might be driven by youth leaders, they'll completely blow up how we think about parks and open space and create really extraordinary new narratives and um, stories, personal stories, which I also think are even more powerful than any data or dominant overarching narrative that we might create. No, that's a, just thank you for your thoughtful response. And I'm so excited to learn from these 14 sites and, and hear about what you discover as this evolves over the next couple of years. Um, so Linda, what I'm thinking, do you have students who are ready to ask questions? I see that there's a question in the chat, so I could start with that or we can go to students. Sure. Why don't we go with the chat and then we'll move into the demo. Great. Um, so then I'll do would you like me to read the chat? Uh, sure, I can read it all. Yeah, why don't you read it so people can hear what's there if they're not looking? Okay, so well so this is so great talk and work. Thank you so much. Um, the P3 call for letters of interest or intent by November 4th mentions that awards will be made up to 14 sites but you suggested the awards are not for projects. Does it help if the applying organization has a specific project in the works as part of their application? Thanks, and the person's name was Mitch. Oh, sorry, that's Mitch Glass. Thank you, Mitch, um, for the question. So what we'll be looking for, so you, you can see mo hopefully most of this in, in the FAQ and call for proposals, but we're, what we're really looking for is a clearly articulated um, rationale for a policy aim, they, the policy aim does not have to be defined um, or a systems change um, and um, a demonstrated success around community engagement and power building. So I, I think, you know, if there is a project that's been in the pipeline or project work and it is part of how the group, uh, the applicant then helps to understand uh, 
the challenges and the policy and systems uh, as they exist, that's helpful. But I don't think, you know, and I'm, we're of course not able to comment on the competitiveness of anything, but <laughs> I think that the idea and, and the central thing we're looking for is an articulation of uh, the park equity needs at kind of a population scale, and then a, a policy trajectory um, and a jurisdiction um, that um, the applicant is interested in influencing with change, whether that's a city, a county, a special district, and to say, we are going to push them to do this kind of change because we will believe it will have broad scale change so that, you know, that maybe that project in a pipeline isn't just an exception, but becomes more um, of the norm. I hope that helps, Mitch, but please probe if you want to. Thanks so much. This is such a, um, this is a very awkward setup. So I'm just gonna do something like, like this so I can half see the audience and half see you here. Um, I think that so much of what you're talking about resonates with all of the topics that we address in our teaching here at school. And I hope the students are really excited about what you have shared just yesterday in my class, which I think at least half of these students were in we were discussing how do you move from theory to practice? How do you make other people care about these issues of equity? And I think that the, the work that you're doing really provides such a clear way of um, making that translation for people. I also just really appreciate this work because I had done something somewhat similar in the area of climate justice. And I reviewed, I, I think I reviewed like a dozen papers or white papers that including a lot of the big names in environmental justice and community building, you'll know all of them, that they've put together about what uh, just resilience or equitable adaptation would look like. And then I categorized it by actually the same three categories of procedural, distributive, and structural change. And what I noticed was that there was a ton in there about distributive justice, a huge amount in there about procedural justice, and almost no one talking about structural change where those are actually the drivers leading to the current inequities that we see. So I'm really excited that you're pushing for the policy piece and um, creating lasting change that will take, as you said, multi-generations to actually see the results of that work. Uh, before I fully open it up to the students, I had a question for you, which is when you first showed some of those inequity, uh, the map in LA, to me, it, it's, a, it's, a quite, it's like an interesting question. Is this a parks problem? or is this a land use and housing problem? Because we want density, we want vibrancy, and whenever you have density, the access to space necessarily is going to be much more constrained. So is it about increasing parks or access within cities? Is it about moving people into communities that historically through their zoning have not allowed more housing to be developed? So I'm trying to understand when you look at policy, are you approaching this as a parks and open space question or as a broader land development question? It's a great question. And Linda, before I go there, I wanna go one thing to what you said you and your students were talking about was how do you get people to care about these issues? My colleagues and I feel like we've been ignored and disparaged around this work for so long. So this, as I said, parks, for us, it feels like parks has a moment, but I wanna say a lot of public health and land use planning work involves being behind the scenes and un unrecognized and unpopular. <laughs> A lot. So I'm glad we're together. Um, and it just takes a lot of patience um, because um, we are pushing up against norms and values um, that um, are not sort of the, the regular frames. Um, we believe in community and public interest. And those are sort of seem to be qualities that, you know, just are easily shunted away. Um, but I, I think, um, Linda, probably the answer is it's both. Um, you know, the, the health data right now, in terms of the health benefits of parks and open space, are very strong on the idea that people need to have proximity. So sometimes that's measured as, a, you know, as you know, probably a quarter mile or a 20 minute walk. And so from one standpoint, I do think it's very important that good facilities are, are near people. And then I think your second piece is, I don't think there's a question that we are, that we are going to have to become more dense as cities. Um, I think all the data shows that that's necessary, but exactly how we, we do that is, is really important and what policy framework exists. I think in a very expensive real estate environment like California, like Los Angeles, 
the, one of the challenges we face is that open space is often pitted against more valuable land uses. And I think um, we need to figure out how we move beyond those kind of either or decisions about, um, because it has to be holistic. You know, we cannot have density without places for respite, lungs in the city, those kinds of things. Um, I think that um, if I understand your question, and there's a good chance I don't, because I think there's a level of complexity um, to what you're asking that develop land developers may understand better. But the one thing I might throw in there and for a, a maybe a deeper discussion is I still think it's very important that we have a, a policy framework that sets the rules for how land development occurs. Um, because again, the development seems to happen more on a project by project basis and developers, whether they're park developers or housing developers are often doing deals at a, at a, at a site and, and there isn't enough of a framework for a regional approach. Um, and we've seen that um, sort of, we need an overarching frame for regional equity. And then in that context, I think we could think more um, effectively about all kinds of decisions from public resource distribution and so on. So I, I might've missed the mark on your question and, and please correct me if I did. No, that was wonderful, thank you so much. All right, I know you guys always have time for questions. Hi, uh, Mrs. Uh, Abuelada. Thanks a lot for speaking with us today. It was really interesting to hear your perspective and um, well, so one thing I really, uh, uh, one thing I really like thought was interesting in your presentation was how you talked about how there are all these different initiatives going on in all these different cities and jurisdictions across the United States, but they aren't really cooperating with one another. That seems like it's a chance. That that seems like it's a bit of an oversight where like there's a lot we could get. We, there's a lot we could gain from that. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, I've also noticed in uh, so urban to, so urban planning spaces and uh, in general design spaces tend to gravitate around large uh, uh, the solutions that large cities have found have found to these issues. Like it's very like the urban planning discourse I've encountered so far. But uh, that being said, I'm only a freshman. Is um, very focused around areas like uh, San Francisco, New York, or Los Angeles. And um, I guess uh, I guess some, something uh, I, I I guess I see a potential risk in uh, further intercity cooperation in that is if is if um, smaller cities like say Milwaukee, like say Milwaukee or like Fres Fresno who are try who are who would be experimenting with their own policies instead decide to follow the leader with whatever say New York, uh, New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles is doing. So um, I guess you, you, you clearly have a lot more experience in that space than I, in this space than I do. So um, I guess like, do you perceive a risk in that, in that regard? And uh, I guess like, how, how do you think we can pursue a framework of intercity cooperation and experience sharing that like helps these different projects while also, enable, while also enabling experimentalism and allowing cities to try to try different solutions that are best suited to their different circumstances. Thank you for that comment and insight and question. I, I think you're right. Like we need um, to have um, in anything we do room for innovation um, and to be sharing best, you know, breath, we, we call them best practices and emerging practices and promising practices or, you know, whatever it is. Um, I think whether we're talking about um, uh, evidence-based program or a policy, um, we, we learned over and over that one size does not fit all. And so I think what you know, we're hoping with um, the, the work that we're doing is um, when we fund the 14 sites, our goal is to create what we're calling a strategic learning exchange. And so that, so for example, if a group like Fresno um, is in the mix and a group like Los Angeles, just creating space. And those are from, from where you guys sit, those are two terrible West Coast examples. We should go Minneapolis um, and, um, and Fresno are in the mix. What we want to create is not an environment where we say, this is what the big cities that are furthest along have done, follow their lead, but to create an environment where folks are sort of learning from each other, from their, um, their successes, their missteps, 
Um, and, you know, so when we interviewed Sandra Celadon, who is a leader in Fresno, um, you know, they had done some work with their young people doing park assessments. And, um, you know, they had, they, she had never, I don't think had worked on a, a finance measure before. And, and so has just a whole bunch of experiences that it would be so great to have her in a national setting where she has a national audience to share with Atlanta and so on. So I think the idea of um, sharing ideas and incubating um, is really important. And then I think because there's so much local variation, it's very rare that anyone can take a cookie cutter approach and just apply it. Um, you know, San Francisco is so unique in its, you know, uh, wealth and um, and compactness, um, you know, and it, it has had some, so I think you're raising an important issue. And I think it's very important that we take the lessons, apply, adapt and, and celebrate the diversity and difference. Um, and I think we'll experience that as we go along. Great. Thank you so much for answering that question. You're welcome. Hey. Hi there. Thanks for your talk. I thought it was really quite interesting. I'm just going to start off by saying that I'm a parker. I like to I self-identify as a parker. I go to national parks, regional parks, neighborhood parks. Anything green space is something that I love. Um, and I received an email during your talk from a state senator that I worked with in California, uh, up in the North Coast, and it was about um, how around 200,000 people last night in California uh, were without a home. So I was wondering, in all the work that you're doing with parks and the crisis of homelessness uh, that is happening in California, uh, is this an adjacent problem that needs structural change that we need to to look at the system of why uh, homelessness is such an issue, especially in this geography, or is there an, uh, a solution within the parks framework that we can work together to uh, lower the rates of homelessness? Um, yeah, so that was, I just wanna see your thoughts. Such an important um, question. Thank you for, for it. And, um, and um, one, one of the subject matter expert interviews that we did was with the um, lead uh, director in, in Minneapolis. And, and um, he, they had really done some very interesting work at the nexus of, of homelessness, housing and, and park space. And I, I think we are just at the cusp of um, deeper solutions um, to this issue. Um, I will say that I think what, one of the things that I got from the interview conversation was one of the challenges that he faced as the leader of the park department was so much around what happens in housing occurs outside of his just jurisdiction and purview. So it was really interesting. It wasn't like he was saying, it's not my problem. He was just really acknowledging like there felt like there were limits to how far he could go with the solution. So one of the practical insights that he had um, he knew his system really intimately, um, saw how displacement was impacting people, but also learned, and I don't know if this was from some other data, that if the density of the unhoused population became at, to a certain, you know, at a certain threshold, that different people, influences, elements would prey on the homeless population. So like, like I don't, I don't want to be crass or blame anybody, but say like, if there became so much un, unhoused people concentrated in area that you would get drug dealers coming in, or you would get people, um, you know, doing human trafficking or whatever. And so what they thought was a solution that they could offer temporarily was to allow a section of a park to be used temporarily for um, you know, people that were living in tents, unhoused, but had to create sort of density limits, both so that the park users could use a park, but th that they could also create relief. And you know, we would have to go to Minneapolis and really get the story because I feel weird telling it secondhand. But it, it set, set, sends a message to me that there are some bright lights. The challenge, he said, one challenge he faced, of course, it gets freezing in Minneapolis. So that's not like a year round solution that even if they could figure out joint solutions to the health impacts and the whatever that that can exist. Um, but um, in a place like Los Angeles, I think in California, you could look at that a little bit differently. I also think um, 
a lot of people say, you know, not, I don't want to say a lot, but sometimes the narrative is we don't want parks. We don't want homeless people. We don't want benches at our bus stops. We don't want homeless people. So I think again, when we think about values and the depth of the crisis that we're in, we ha probably have to do a very deep cross-sector analysis. I think we're at a point in our history where the housing and homelessness crisis is a, you know, uh, and, and, uh, in all policies, in all sectors consideration, it's become an issue that transportation has to deal with, you know, and so on and so forth. So this is a global issue um, and has to do with so many things, as you know, speculative land use behaviors, you know, all that stuff. Um, and, and it's a crisis. So I think there are some solutions um, and some bright spots and, and we need many, 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 many more and, and faster. Great, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Aboleta, thanks for your presentation. I love when you talk about the community power, pick up on community power to like resist the structure or authority. And also when you talk about procedure justice, it's very like combined with um, conformed with our, our topic this week in planning class. And um, since last week when we uh, when we had another lecture, uh, the lecturer talked about how NGO um, made, made influence in Indonesia and how the most people in that NGO organizations are made of middle classes people. And um, I have also seen in your presentation that um, when you talk about uh, UCLA institution participation and also like there are very many left wings foundations into that. So my question would be like, uh, who, who actually organized the community power? I mean, when you talk about procedure justice, who are the participation of participators into that procedure to justice? And who, who, who are the advocates when you talk about people advocates for resistance? And do they share like similar demographic backgrounds? Thank you. Thank you. Um, your question um, reflects a lot of insight and, and wisdom. And um, this is, um, what is it? It's like a, a journey and a challenge we have to constantly be um, uh, exploring and challenging ourselves in because, of course, you know, I come with a professional experience um, and I care deeply about these issues. And so, you know, I think the process of how organizations and, and staff like mine engage others and align with grassroots power building is um, a critical question for our work. One of the, the things that I think is important and what we've tried to, to both advocate for and do when we have had the opportunity is to invest in lo those local grassroots power building groups who I think as your question and statement implies, really reflect the demographic and lived experience of the, the people that rent, live, work in, in, in residence, uh, in communities that may not have, you know, a certain, you know, economic uh, attainment or educational attainment. And so in Los Angeles, like in many places, like in New York, there is a, a very sophisticated culture and history of grassroots power building organizations that follow the techniques and philosophies of door-to-door -door organizing, popular education. There are many faith-based groups um, as well that do that where it's, uh, you know, to use the word authentic, extremely authentic work. When we're talking about engaging folks in, in a new arena, I think two things sort of, at least two things have to happen. One is that groups um, have to be supported to engage in that work. One of the narratives, um, as Amelia asked, that um, we encountered, we were doing some interviews with um, the kind of authentic base building groups in Los Angeles around the issues of stormwater infrastructure and mainstream environmental groups 
would say people of color don't really care about stormwater. They don't really care about parks and open space. We've heard that over and over. But when we talked to the organizations, what we found was that they were often not supported to care, to work on, to educate themselves. So they would often feel experience what they would feel like as a get tokenized. A $1,500 stipend to show up and you know represent their whole community as opposed to uh, you know, resources to support staff to really engage with community members, get the experiences of mothers, talk to young people. And so there, there's a, a way to do the work that you're talking about, a way to do it authentically, but it is um, painstaking. It takes time and it takes investment um, in investing in those organizations who do that work. So in Measure A, for example, there was a group called Promesa Boyle Heights um, that had um, been funded through First 5 LA, which is our tobacco commission. And they had been um, training resident leaders, moms with, you know, moms with babies in strollers around the issues of parks and open space, around green stormwater infrastructure. And those were some of the moms dressed up in the t-shirts. Um, and they, you know, they had had their capacity, their knowledge invested in so that they could apply their real lived experiences of, I don't have somewhere to take my kid that I feel safe letting them play to the evidence so that they saw that this was part of a broader framework. And that was very powerful work. Um, and there were several examples um, like that. Is that helpful response? Yes. Thank okay, thank you for your question. It's a really important one. And I will just add, I'm sorry you're leaving, but just because those people shows up, <laughs> sorry, got your physical activity. I, I just wanted to say at the same time, even though those folks would show up at hearings and come to our meetings, um, there were a lot of barriers, structural barriers that were very hard for me to see. For example, um, the, our, our, the Measure A Oversight Committee would never change their meeting times. Oftentimes, by the time it was time for public comment, um, the experts sitting around the table would leave because they had another meeting and wouldn't really listen actively to, to the moms. Um, so I think there's also a process. I'm not saying put all our energy into fixing the inside of systems, but there are some processes which have made government systems not very receptive. And that can also make community residents feel disrespected and not show up. And even though these people continue to show up um, because ultimately they prevailed and pushed the system, um, but it is sad to me that it takes that level to get the respect and responsiveness, whereas often more white affluent and organized communities have easy access to communities. They can just call up their representative and be like, oh, Mary, you know, you live around the corner, I'm sitting, you know, whatever. And that's, those are big dynamics that we need to unt untangle that rest with the people in power to change themselves and, and rest with the power building groups to elevate uh, the power that blows the wind. And I believe very strongly in both of those things. Hey, thanks, Th thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Karen. Wyatt has a question. I hope it's not the case that only our gentlemen friends care about parks, people, and power. So I'm going to really encourage the ladies in the audience to surface some questions and also to invite the folks online that if you have a question, you can uh, raise your hand and um, Alexis will help us on you as well. Go ahead, everyone. Hello, thanks for being here. Um, Thank you. Had you. Talked, you had talked about um, both quantity and quality of parks and kind of as one of the earlier questions uh, alluded to, there's lots of different types of parks, whether it's national parks, regional parks, nature parks, open parks, skate parks, dog parks, whatever. Um, and so I'm kind of curious about what makes a good park or what makes a park right for a certain place. Um, I am not an expert in that question. I am also a parker. I didn't know that was a term, but I will become a parker. I also love parks and, and in my community in South LA um, have the privilege of being able to walk to a state park, a, a local city park and so on. Um, I used to be on the board of an organization called the Los Angeles Neighborhood Land Trust for five years and got to learn a little more insight into to that. They were a um, nonprofit 
land developer for parks um, and, and really played an incredibly important bridging function, I think, um, often filling gaps that the city government or, or county government could, could not feel, also able to do somewhat, sometimes more complex deals um, and also able to do things at a smaller scale. And they, um, they had gardens, um, uh, community, you know, community gardens, they had a, you know, skate park, um, and they also kind of had a methodology for looking um, first going door to door and understanding what the interests and needs of the nearby community were, because they were really interested in building the park. And then after they did that work, um, and this is if they were starting from scratch. Sometimes if they were taking over operations of a, a city park that was not being well programmed or maintained um, and brought in to do that work, then they you know, could also look around, see what the needs and use were. I think some of the principles, um, first of all, I think being well maintained is really important. I think for particularly low income black and brown communities, when things like a light goes out, graffiti shows up, a sprinkler is broken, it is very important for there to be continuous and rapid cleanup. It's kind of like the broken windows theory, you know, eyes on the street things. People need to know that someone cares and someone is stewarding it. I also think there's some data on the um, age and cultural appropriateness of parks. Um, so there's some, been some work both in Japan and here that talks about how, how people use parks. So seniors often like something different, you know, Tai Chi, a space for slower movement, a plate, benches, places for shade. Those are all really important qualities for so-called more passive park uses. Um, I think the other thing that becomes really important if it's a park for young people is that there are age appropriate facilities. So some of the most sort of cool ones, like there's one in Santa Monica, which is built around the concept of universal design. I think it's like Aiden's Park. And so it's uh, children of all abilities have access to you know, the facilities and, and so on. And so I think sort of in bigger buckets than the question you're asking, I think it's culturally appropriate, uh, age appropriate, you know, uh, accessible and available to all users and then well-maintained and then recognizing that communities are not static organisms. So as communities change, parks need to change. I think the other thing that we've seen in data is important is programming matters. Um, if parks are underutilized, sometimes activated program can be really important, whether that's a Zumba class or you know, a crafts um, class um, that goes on. So again, different types of users. Um, in Harvard Park, a very low income small city in South Los Angeles that is kind of one square miles and experience a lot of violence, they needed to have a, um, a different set of interventions, including a police, a community policing substation that brings all kinds of questions about the presence of police in communities that are over policed. They, they worked it out. They were able to work it out. They also added a walking program, um, a walking, a rubberized walking path, use uh, city and county dollars to renovate um, the parks um, and so on. So I think there are so many things that are very locally grounded. Um, but there are, um, you know, a number of dimensions. Um, I also think, you know, there are different ideas around, as you said, the local, the local pocket park, the local larger park, the regional park, and what people expect from those, and then the state and national treasures, and what people expect from, from those uses. Um, and so, you know, those are all important dimensions um, as well. And I think there is some good literature on that. And what I've seen there was a really good book, I for, I'm blanking on the woman who wrote it, but also um, that sometimes right now we struggle with who gets to define what makes a good park. And so often if we're only looking at dominant culture, you know, more middle-class affluent white perspectives of a good park, then they might be like, we do not want mariachi bands in the park. We don't want soccer in the park. And those can often be code word dog whistles for, we don't want those people in our park. We, we don't want it, we want it to be quiet in a certain way. And those cues are also very important. So they wrote a book, um, her name keeps flashing in, then I keep losing it, um, about, you know, including diverse cultural experiences and voices in, in interviewing and asking what makes a good park um, for you. And I'll, I'll try to find that book or you can contact me by email, but it should be just a Google away. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, thank you so much for your lecture. It was super useful. I actually have two questions here. Uh, I I come from India and we have like a super hot climate here. So it is really difficult for us to maintain our parks the way that is done here. So can you uh, uh, suggest we alternate to public spaces with the same benefits of that of the park uh, for the places with such climate? And my second question is the controversies uh, relating to the fencing of parks. That uh, how uh, the fence can like uh, reduce uh, the accessibility, but at the same time provide protection. So the controversy is related to that. And can you please, um, the, I think I got it, but I want to just, can, the first part of your question was around climate, and, heat and climate and parks, or did I totally miss it? Yeah, so the first question was, I, I come from India. So there we have like a, a, a super hot climate. So it's really difficult to maintain the parks and grass and things like that. So uh, can you suggest me alternative public spaces that provides the same benefits? as such of park, but uh, we don't have to like maintain it as such of park. Thank you. And I think you, your question <laughs> and, and whatever you learn when you keep asking that question over and over is gonna be important for all of us because we are on a, a, a heating planet. Um, and so this is, is true um, in lots of places. I mean, I think first of all, in embedded in your question um, is that public spaces are really important. <laughs> and and so, um, so I think the issue for us in that life expectancy study I mentioned, um, what we act, LA is a very um, under green, gray reflective um, county as a whole. So we have very little vegetation. And what we actually found in that was that tree canopy was extremely important um, around life ex as, a, as a predictor of, of life expectancy difference. So that was in our models. And so one is I think when we think of parks, we do need to think of parks as a place where trees that give cover, shade and cover and cooling, um, not just car carbon capture, but that's good too, um, exists. So I think that's very important. I also, I mean, this is a little complicated, but um, in places where rain is, which is more places, it comes and then we don't see it for a long time, like Los Angeles. Um, there's a lot of really cool um, stormwater uh, capture and, and hidden retention basins under, under parks. But I think, you know, you know, kind of taking it up to a policy and systems level, I think that there are some really important opportunities, again, to do spatial mapping, see how people are using spaces and what they what they might need. Um, I'm noticing in LA, it, it, in addition of a lot of different water features, use of recycled water um, to again, create that cooling, cooling environment. And so I think that, you know, hopefully we don't get to a, a level of crisis where we're running out of options, but that is certainly what the UN code red is telling us, not just about India, but everywhere. So this is a problem and an issue. Um, the other thing, um, that um, and and I think the other thing is in uh, parks being spaces for climate adaptation, um, and so like when there's fires, when there's um, thank you, um, and and when there's displacement, that parks are places for emergency shelter, um, food, emergency food, and cooling centers, um, including when electricity and grids go down. So those are all innovative solutions, and parks can be used as part of social infrastructure. Fences are complicated. Um, fences, there's a lot, as you said, a lot of controversy. Um, I tend to be of the mind that if it's possible for um, ongoing programming and stewardship to kind of activate a park to where we don't need fences, that is better. But in some cases, park pet fences are good to protect people, not only from, you know, just to be able to close the park, but also um, if it's near traffic and you can have really strong fences to prevent a car from crashing right into a tot lot. We had to do that in one of the parks. So fences are important. I think there was some great work in New York City that looked at widening fences and doing other treatments to make fences be more like art and less like barriers that close people out. Sorry, Amelia, are we losing time here? I'll try to do now. Should we go into soundbite round or are we no, done? No, no, not at all. I was just doing question prompts. You're, you're doing great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your questions. Hello there. Hi. 
Um, so I, my name is Owen. Um, I'm from Philadelphia, and uh, I worked at PHS and worked with uh, Dr. Eugenia South. I don't know if you're familiar with her work. And uh, she does a lot of work around kind of like vacant lot remediation and kind of the effects on mental health and gun violence. Um, but when I was working at PHS and working on community engagement, one of the major issues that residents always bring up is that even though they kind of talk about displacement as like something they want to protect in the near future, that a lot of these health benefits, especially the long-term ones, they don't feel like they're going to be a part of that because of the, especially vacant lots, the ownership of those lots are not with the city, they're with private developers. So can you kind of talk about like, it's different based on different places and kind of you know, post-industrial cities having more access to vacant land. But kind of, can you discuss a little bit more about kind of the anti-displacement policies that you've kind of seen in your work? Um, thank you so much. And um, you come with um, a lot having worked with her and at PHS. I just got an email today that she, I think she or her center um, had a, received a $10 million NIH grant um, uh, for environmental and health issues. So more to come from that work, um, which will you know generate more answers than I certainly feel like I have. Um, I think as the previous question related housing, this feels like such an overwhelming and complicated issue. Um, however, um, I think um, one, that issue you described around um, is community residents feeling, is this for us? Um, you know, is a very profound and real multi-generational concern. And even not just for parks, but I, um, when many years ago, I did a series of profiles commissioned by Dick Jackson at the Centers for Disease Control National Center for Environmental Health. And one of them was in Stanford, Connecticut. And Tony Eiten was then at the um, health department and they wanted to do a cleanup of the Mill River Parkway. And the residents there said, don't bother cleaning it up. We've already been displaced by a stadium, you know, so stadiums and arenas are another real displacer. So, I, I mean, I think ultimately, um, you know, <laughs> what do we believe as a society about housing? We like to throw around the idea that housing is a right, but we behave that housing is a, a privilege and a, that is uh, based on the resources you have and it and, and the market runs free in that. So if we do not, I think, believe that, and most of the work, at least in California, is based, I think, on a dominant theory that more supply will solve our problem. But I don't think that. I think we need to basically discipline markets and insist on very affordable housing at very every level, very, very affordable. We are at a point in LA, which I think you probably are in New York, that affordable housing is at a price where it's like, that's where um, a police uh, a police person or a fire person, that's what they're affording. Now, those, those are city, you know usually city or county government jobs making a lot of money and that they're now only able on their income to afford affordable housing is, um, is wrong, I think, uh, if we talk about everyone else. So I think, I mean, one thing is when I think about this issue, I don't just think about it as a brick and mortar housing or land issue. I think it's a jobs and income issue as well. Malo Hudson, uh, who I think is still at Berkeley, wrote a really good book, which was a few different vignettes um, of places that have attempted to do work, looking, sort of connecting these issues. And I feel like one of them, I don't know where it was, Boston, but they, it was, I think there was a university um, who was a big employer and a big landowner. So this happens in lots of places. And one of the things that they tried to do, again, like through multi-sector partnership, was connect their own uh, sort of land practices and ownership practices with developing career ladders so that people that work for the university didn't have to keep moving farther and further out because they were barely getting a living wage. So they use workforce investment um, uh, pipelines and dollars to connect to this issue. So I think we really need to have a combination of strategies, but we cannot keep wages stagnant and expect people to survive in an affordable housing market. And I think this goes back to Linda's question of also how are we handling Density because if our model it's less so maybe in a place like New York, but in California, if we just keep thinking we're going to sprawl out into the desert and build cheaper houses, we're at some point our kids or our kids' kids are going to face 
that um, dynamic as those cities become more dense and that property becomes more expensive. And we can't just gobble up all of the open land that's been used for agriculture. So this is a big problem. Um, and I think those perceptions are real. Um, I do think that sometimes um, land prices go up when we do the, that kind of greening. I don't think it has to be that way. I think there can be protections, renter protections. I think that there can be um, you know, rent control, which is a bad word, word in a lot of places. But I think we need more innovation and strategy in this area. Thank you very much. Thanks. This mic doesn't work very well for you to hear me, so I'm just going to come here and say, um, so I want to ask one last question in closing, which is that we have a lot of students here from countries outside the United States, and not all of these places are democracies. Uh, not all of these places have corruptions run by um, not corrupt, or uh, shall I say, like more, uh, plenty of governments have very corrupt people running them, and students don't feel necessarily that the government is a place where they can go and make change. Um, certainly community planning is also not, or like community-based organizations are not always prevalent in many places. That's a basic assumption here is that when you go to a community, that there is an organization to go to or that uh, there is a way to capacitate by investing in training. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or recommendations or lessons learned that are nuggets about the underlying theory of change that you developed that might be portable or that could be um, actualized in other ways and other contexts, but the way of thinking that is super important and just to, to bring us to a close with that thought. Thank you. And, and I do not feel um, sort of expert in, um, in the, the many of the issues you raise. So I don't wanna over sort of overdo it, but I will say that when I, um, during my Stanton fellowship, I had an opportunity to travel to Medellin, Colombia. And, um, you know, it was a very uh, wonderful and enlightening experience. It doesn't exactly measure up to, you know, all the conditions that you were describing. Um, but one thing um, was amazing to see, first of all, um, for them, they had in their um, codified um, some, some language around human rights. Um, that they actually sort of, even though there are many violations of that, lots of corruption by the narco trafficking and all of those things, um, those norms, I think over time became very important levers for them in later as they sort of what they call coming out of the darkest night uh, of Colombia. Um, a lot of um, multi um, agency sort of, I don't want to say agency, but it was activists in the university toiling together and with community residents to sort of develop first models and bright spots, very localized, what they kind of called experiments, and then building a bit more of a culture of innovation. Um, and now, you know, they're lauded all over in planning um, journals and Newsweek magazine as smart cities and you know, they have not rooted out inequity and a lot of people don't have basic infrastructure and you can see housing, um, you know, conditions are, are very challenged because of their geography. My, my thing that I think is important is um, participatory processes at whatever level, people getting together and talking together, defining their needs, um, starting even with small, small experiments and solutions and then ideally finding support or connection in people, academic leaders or academic, you know, folks in academia um, and connecting, um, you know, there may not be, you know, sort of the whole of government may not function in a way that's responsive, but often government is just people that are in community. So there is often the need, ability to find champions and people who hold values. So I think that's important. I think this issue of narrative is very important. And I think no matter where we are now, we're connected with global, you know, social media in most places. I mean, communication is not equally distributed, but I think we can look at what's happened in Afghanistan and see like, you know, change, <laughs> change is uneven and um, has ebbs and flows. So I think there are lessons from all 
all over the world in this space where we can gather bright spots and need to keep plowing ahead. Um, and, and I really, you know, I've been thinking a lot about human rights and the United Nations as a, a, a tool for change. And I, I still feel, you know, even though human rights hasn't sort of been a major motivating factor in Cal in the United States, that there's still a lot to hang on to there. And I think that for the global community, some of their articulations on the Millennium Development Goals and and um, and so on become important tethers um, for progressively realizing that no matter where we are. But those are very real challenges. What we're seeing in Haiti um, represents much of that um, as well. So I think it's a great question and a great uh, problem to solve by strengthening our global connection. Thank you so much for everything you have shared with us today. Let's give Manal a warm. Thank you for having me. I know that our students in the past have um, followed up with speakers. You might be getting some emails. Thanks for sharing that with us. And again, I, with I welcome them. And um, best of luck to all of you in your future leadership goals. You will do great things. And you have two wonderful uh, professors to challenge you to do even more of that. So don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a nice afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, Amelia.